several times in our meetings and how in the scriptures the Holy Spirit is able to sum up the life of a person by the like epochs and um, how they were relevant to the purpose of God and how it pertained to salvation. And just last Friday night, he said, I wrote it down, it was so good. He said, learn to scan your life to look at the mountaintops, not at the valleys. So today, I wanted to focus mainly on the time frame that I've lived here in Joplin. And um, more specifically, just two mountaintop experiences. (laughs) It's occurred in the last year or so. And I wanted to say a couple things. Um, God is glorified when his people are able to identify the working of the Lord in them and to testify about it. Testifying fortifies the body as we are all knit together in Christ. We learn not only from our own trials and our own victories, but also from one another's trials and one another's victories as well. And the prime example would be Job. We haven't all personally endured as Job has, but we have all been able to see God more clearly as a result of Job's faithfulness in the midst of his trial. And that that's why we testify to one another. (laughs) Something else I was thinking about as I was preparing was that the testifier has a chance to practice confessing for the judgment. (laughs) Scripture says we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all confess and give account of ourselves to God. On the judgment day, everyone will be called to give a testimony. So I'm practicing right now. <laughs> we want to be able to give a good testimony in the, in, the day, in the judgment day. Brother Jason spoke yesterday about this and said, uh, like in the judgment day is an inspection. I thought that was very good. Um, to pass inspection, there can be no sin. Uh, however, I was also thinking that um, it doesn't end at the sin that's not there. The inspection also looks for what is there. Yes, amen. There, that is where the glory is. It's in what Jesus has made us to be in that day. Christ Jesus took away the sin, but it didn't end there. On that day, we will be made like him in all ways, in our body or everything. We'll be perfected, completed. We won't be standing in the judgment garbed in our flesh. That defilement will be gone. We've already been given a new heart and our new creatures. So on that day, we will be in perfect agreement with the Lord. We'll be, who is our judge also. It's good to be in agreement with a judge. When charges are brought up, I've been thinking about this, when charges are brought up before I was in Christ, I'm going to be able to say truth, Lord, but I have believed on Christ Jesus. I've been washed by his blood and have been given a new heart, so I hate those things too now, even as you do. And also, what about the things that we do for the Lord now? As if um, maybe we will, will be, be, we will be giving an account for why we hated our lives in this world. Why am, why am I raising my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Well, then I can also say, Lord, you gave me to believe. I saw what manner of love Christ had for his father and him giving himself as a ransom for many. And that constrained me to give my life for him. I say these things because even now we're exhorted to examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. Brother Given also brought this out recently in the, in the series of the Lord's Table and examining yourself. Don't just look for the things that aren't like God. Look for the things that are like God. When you find them, they confirm to, you, to your heart that you are in the faith and it, and it brings you assurance. So I wanted, I wanted to begin my testimony with a confession that I was once a sinner. That was the sum total of my life before Christ, so that's all I'm going to say about that. But I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. I do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I do love him, though I cannot see him, and I am looking and anticipating for the day of, of his return. Now, I remember when we first came to Joplin, 
and sat through a couple of meetings, I remember thinking, we're going to have to hit the ground running if we're going to be able to keep up with the brethren here. <laughs> or, we, or we'd just be left behind. And it, it, it's as if, like when Jesus was here on the earth, if the disciples wanted to remain disciples, they were going to have to go where Jesus was, and he was always on the move. So it was, it's the same principle as I, was, as I was thinking. The more I heard the gospel spoken, the more the truth opened up in the assembly, the more my appetite increased. I wasn't content with the idea of just having a shallow knowledge of God. I wanted more. I wanted to be able to handle the word of God rightly, to speak intelligently about the things of God, to have a profitable two-sided conversation, <laughs> not just be sitting there listening. I wanted to be able to contribute. I wanted to be able to navigate in the truth and labor alongside of the brethren not to just sit on the sidelines as a spectator. And you'll notice that in all of those desires, those are all godly aspirations that came from him. So anytime we have a godly inclination, the source is God himself, and he will give us the grace to achieve those things. I also wanted to make note, obviously these things are not unique to myself. These things have happened to all of you, brethren, too. This is the norm of the kingdom. Uh, John 4.14 says... Um, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Again, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So this, this flowing is a result of believing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. People of God speak about God. I was also remembering Peter and John when they um, took them and they um, threatened them and commanded them not to speak in the name of the Lord. And Peter and John answered and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. For we cannot help but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Speaking unto edification is the normal response in the kingdom. Um, another important aspect to see is when we receive these aspirations, it's when we're gathered with the saints. We get them there because that's where Jesus works. He's working in his body. So as I grew, I wanted to be a blessing to the brethren and um, to be able to say the things that was opening up to me. But I had a, I had a sort of like a withered hand experience. I was in the, I was in the assembly you know, that man with the withered hand was in the temple where he was, he was in the right place. He had a, had a hindrance, and the Lord made him whole. At this, uh, there was a time where I had a, a problem, I guess you could say, with getting up and speaking out in front of an audience. And it wasn't just the part of just getting up here and speaking, although I had to overcome that too. It was more of the fear of saying something that was wrong or misrepresenting the Lord and feeling my own inadequacy in my preparations. And so when you've, when you've rehearsed that, it's I, I, mine. So I, took, I would just remain silent. And looking back, I can see how Satan, he's very subtle. And he just twisted that a little bit, just ever so slightly, so that um, I, just, I, kinda, I just thought what I had to say was it um, as important or really didn't need to be said because these brethren are all very high quality brethren. They already know these things. Why would I need to say it? <laughs> How could I ever add to their faith? But I can now identify that that thought was a fiery dart because it removed the emphasis off of who God is and what he is doing onto myself. <clears throat> Something I'm learning is that when we think too inwardly, we can't be very productive for the kingdom. But when we see the truth of the matter is that we are vessels for the Lord's use, <clears throat> it liberates us from self-centeredness, and it makes us to be more God-centered. Salvation is about God. <laughs> it makes for times of great refreshments, of great refreshment in our labors for the Lord, and then that labor is a joyful one. 
I'm seeing more that if God has given insight to anybody, um, specifically to me since I've had this issue, who am I to determine how light or weighty or small or important it is? My job is to believe it <laughs> and then speak it, to share it with the body. Any amount of revelation of the mystery of God is not small, nor is it just for the individual. It's meant for the body. I found that at the times I, I did actually sign up <laughs> sporadically, most of the time my preparations always gravitated toward the subject of speaking what you've been given to see, <laughs> which I thought was very ironic because I was the girl who didn't say much and I'm talking to the brethren about speaking up. But I can see that this was um, the Lord being long suffering with me. He was teaching me to trust him in this area. And this testimony is a testimony in of itself. <laughs> um, something happened where a slot opened up in the last 10 days. I had 10 days, which that's a lot of time really when you think about it. But um, you know, when Sister June called me and asked me to do it, I was elated. I was eager to accept it because I knew that the Lord would give me grace to say something to you, brethren. <clears throat> Laboring in the word to speak to the brethren has transformed from a heavy burden to bear into a time of sweet fellowship with the Lord. So that dart, after all, wasn't allowed to stick because Jesus, who was exalted, didn't permit it. He ministered assurance to my heart, which rendered Satan's attack to be futile. And that, that was, um, that's been a very high time for me, especially of late, to, to be able to see those things. Um, another epoch, I guess is what you could say, this will, would probably be an epoch the whole rest of my life, is as you remember last year, as our family's deliverance from the tornado. And um, in a recent ladies' meeting, Sister June, she led and she asked us, what have you learned about God and salvation and how do you know it? Or in other words, what experience taught you this? And through that, I learned about the power of God to save and his wisdom and how he's able to orchestrate events precisely so that to keep his people in the midst of great turmoil. This experience has given me greater confidence in, in God's ability to save because salvation was flushed out right before our eyes. I wanted to uh, go through some of the details. Um, they're won't be the same exact ones that I've spoken of before, but just to draw out some comparisons of, of salvation in these events. The day of the tornado, um, it was on the Lord's Day, and we didn't even know that there was a threat. <laughs> um, our television hadn't been on for two months, and so we didn't even know that bad weather was a possibility that day. And um, what I saw in that was, if God hadn't made it known, man would not be aware of what danger they were in. God had to teach mankind what he was like and that consequently we were not like him and we would not survive um, a confrontation with him. Man left on their, his own devices would not have sought after God, but God is good and he is merciful. And he um, has told us that his wrath is going to come but not only that, but he's told us his purpose is to get us to a safe place so that when he does come, we can survive it. And that place is in Christ Jesus. Um, on that day, I was just about ready to take a nap when I heard the sirens. And we got the warning, and I knew um, we had a very short time to prepare for it. Um, God has turned on the sirens of salvation, so to speak. You, um, well, we have the prophets and the, and the brethren in the, in the scriptures, and then you, brethren, who are preachers, you're like sirens. Um, you're like sounding out with a great sound so that all can hear the warning of the wrath of God that it's coming, and it's high time to seek a, sh a shelter. Yes. Who, we need to be covered under the wing of Christ if we want to survive. 
the time to prepare is short. We had a very short time to prepare. And the, this time is short as well. The scripture says, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. <clears throat> well, we, my family and I, we heeded this, this warning, and we gathered up what was precious, our children, and went to the safest place that we had. It was a little half bathroom downstairs um, on the bottom floor. It didn't have any windows. But um, those who hear the warning and they see that provision has been made, we run to Christ. <laughs> he truly is a shelter in the time of storm. Psalm 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runneth into it and is safe. Amen. Even though we got the warning, this is something I've kind of been able to see a little bit of late. Even though we did get the warning of the tornado, we didn't realize the magnitude of jeopardy we were really in. Um, the Kansas City Star published a little bit about the tornado. They said it was upgraded to an EF5, the strongest category in the scale, with winds exceeding 200 miles an hour. The storm was a multi-vortex tornado with two or more small and intense centers of rotation orbiting the larger funnel itself. A rare occurrence, they called it. I don't think the churches are probably warning the people of God about the wrath that is coming. I think we're all going to find that the wrath of God is worse than we could ever imagine. In this tornado, we could see just a glimpse, a very small glimpse, because even then it was mixed with mercy. But on the judgment, he, when he pours it out, whatever it's going to land on is not going it won't survive it will be destroyed so we want to take full advantage of the time we have now the lord's extended great mercy he, he desires mercy <laughs> and so we want to run into jesus now so we rode out that storm in that little tiny space and um was the whole house was violently ripped apart around us um it was about as flat as it as it really could have been um there wasn't any wall. There wasn't even a wall left. <laughs> it was a two-story house, and there wasn't even a wall. But um, that moment, I had never felt so completely helpless. My children were crying out, but I could not save them. We are always at the mercy of God, but I realized it more perfectly in that moment. Lamentations 3.22 says, It is of the Lord's mercy that, ye are, that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. <clears throat> Even though not one wall was standing, we all came out without a scratch. Um, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. <clears throat> John 10 says, No man shall pluck us out of his hand. He is exalted far above all. So there isn't even a worthy opponent <laughs> to even challenge him. Amen. The storms of life will come, but if you abide in Christ and stay in that place of safety, he'll bring you out without a scratch too. Amen. After the storm passed, we remained. <laughs> God is going to shake the heavens and the earth once more as he has promised to shake the things that can be shaken. That's it. The things that can't be shaken will remain. And those who have been um, begotten of God, they will remain. Amen. This deliverance um, caused for us to break out in praise right away. We thanked the Lord uh, before we even tried to crawl out. We just were huddled there and gave great thanksgiving to the Lord. And um, I, con I considered with that is the natural and appropriate response um, to the Lord, when you see his working, you, you, when you're able to perceive the work of God, it provokes praise to, to God. And um, in the judgment, this praise to God by his people will only continue and excel. I was reminded in the Revelation <clears throat> that we read of like outbreaks of praise. <laughs> and um, in, in the world to come, Ephesians says that in the ages to come, 
he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So there's, I'm sure as we go through into eternity, we're just going to continue to have these outbreaks of praise. More, the more we see of God, we'll be able to, to offer up thanksgiving and praise to him for it. So looking back at the aftermath of that, how God saved us, it's only drawn me nearer to him. I've been able to behold a more intense manner of God's character, his forwardness to save, the tender mercy he extends to our frailness, his protecting hand, and how he shields us to survive trials, and the peace that he gives us to, to stay in our right minds, and then also grace to perceive the work he has done. So in some sense, my testimony is really the same as everyone's here, but the difference is just maybe some circumstances. We have all been ransomed. We've all had our sins forgiven and being changed from one glory to the next. We all have access to every resource we would ever need in Christ Jesus as well as the grace to employ it. Um, we all have access to the throne of God. We all have Jesus, our great and high priest, making intercession, intercession for his people. We all have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, the armor of God to resist the devil. And as long as we keep the faith, we will all make it to the finish line. We'll cross in to glory unscathed, unharmed, perfected, without spot or wrinkle. And that being said, I, when, I, when I say that our testimonies are similar, I'm not implying that salvation is generic. It's, it's the glory in it is that whatever circumstance you're in, Christ is exalted and he's able to save. It doesn't matter what, ex what circumstance you're in. He can, he can save no matter where you are. <laughs> so anyways, that's my testimony today. Amen.